No my hi my and welcome to this edition of Playmakers. Well, what is a playmaker? A playmaker is someone who steers people in the right direction and can make critical decisions, but they don't actually have to be on the field. And tonight's playmaker is none other than the newest chef de mission from the New Zealand Olympic Committee for Birmingham 2022, and that is Nigel Avery. Nigel, congratulations on the post. Was this something that you went after or was it right place, right time? Yeah, I think it was right place, right time. And, and really got to thank my wife, Shelley, for that. Um, we saw you know, the role come up and, and at that stage, I was really focused on, a, I had a bit of a career pivot, um, moving from the wine sector into sort of financial advice, mortgage broking. And I didn't think I'd have time, but we sort of, as we talked about it more and talked about it with um, my colleagues down south where Mortgage Me came from, we decided that um, yeah, we could make both work because I only really wanted to, um, I guess, put my head into the ring if I could do it as well as I could possibly could, like everything I do. And yeah, so Shelley um, is going to come and support me in, on that side of my day job sort of thing to free up time you know, for the, the chef role, which at times you know, will be all encompassing clearly during games time, um, 100%. Um, but others, you know, sort of a bit more intermittent and, and kind of everything in between. So, yeah, I'm really privileged to have her to support me to allow this to happen. Well, your resume is a strong one. Olympics, five Commonwealth Games medals, primarily as a weightlifter. Talk to me about weightlifting. How did weightlifting come about? Because you were one of the big boys. Yeah, um, I kind of fell into it by accident. It was kind of serendipitous. Um, I started off as, a, as a, in track and field was my love and um, ended up being a triple jumper. Um, but I guess uh, it all sort of came about um, watching John Walker in 1976 winning his medal, going, wow, this is awesome. I'd like to be in a position like him one day, maybe. And uh, and that sort of started my sort of quest to try and make a, a team. And unfortunately, athletics, I fell a bit short. I was about 12 centimetres short, in fact, from qualifying for 1990 Commonwealth Games. But that, through other things, led me to be recruited into the New Zealand bobsleigh team. I thought, well, maybe... Maybe I can make it in the winter games. Um, and that didn't quite make, work out either. But I guess the, the training for triple jump, um, the explosiveness, the speed, the training for bobsleigh, which is a lot of you know, power cleans and explosive movements, again, just absolutely aligned with um, weightlifting. And it was through the training for bobsleigh um, uh, in the weight room at Gillies Avenue in Auckland uh, where the weightlifters trained. And I sort of all of a sudden became quite competitive with them and started lifting more than some of them. And I thought, wow, man, this um, this could be for me. And uh, Richard Dryden, who turned out to my, be my long-term weightlifting coach, was there at the time. And he was the one who said, hey, you should compete in this. And um, it was kind of my third competition. I think I achieved what would have been the qualifying total for, for KL Commonwealth Games. And so, yeah, the rest, um, it's history. I stopped you know, training for Bob Slay and, and that's a shot put in athletics and, and diverted focus into the sport of weightlifting, which I, I really love. Where is the biggest buzz when it comes to getting a weight? When you see those three white lights. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's um sometimes it can it can actually be in the for me it was in the in the in the training room. Like you get to a certain weight and all of a sudden it just you can just sort of feel the movement and the flow and, and, and what kind of was heavy a couple of weeks ago as you're leading into a competition feels you know, relatively light and it just starts to move. And uh, that, that's a great buzz. But I think the real one is, is, is doing your best, you know, um, hitting your personal best in a competition. You know, there's, there's nothing there's nothing greater. And that doesn't matter really where you come, and whether you come 17th as I did in the Olympic Games or first as I did in Manchester Commonwealth Games. Uh, it's all about doing your best. So right now, you're, you're a key playmaker. You're the chef de mission for Birmingham 2022. So let's just break this down. For you, what's your modus operandi? What's your MO? Yeah, I guess for me, it's it's 100% all about the, the athlete and the team and, and how do we optimise the environment to enable the greatest chance of success for the you know, team members, whether they be um, supporters and you know, physio or, or preparation or recovery coaches and most specifically for it for the athletes um so you know we're all you know going to be um uh, marked against their performance as a as a team as a whole uh and as to how many medals and all, all those sort of things but I, I think you know even though there may be some targets 
near, particularly by sports, because they've got some relationships, key ones with high performance sport New Zealand, and they are some big KPIs. I think for us, as, as part of the management group, is just if we can create that environment, you know, put the structures in place, you know, make sure that everybody feels really welcome, really part of a team, and, and all those other peripheral things around it. Um, if they show up healthy and you know, mentally strong, then they're going to have the greatest chance of doing better. Um, and so if we can only add just a tiny bit to their performance, then, then our job is done. Um, because at the end of the day, they're, they're no slugs. They're, they're New Zealand's best. They're going to be in great shape for that moment. We've just got to help sort of smooth that as, as much as we can to, to contribute it, um, that last tiny little bit that they may need. And that could be the difference between you know, a, a great result or a really good result. Okay, lots of management talk in there, KPIs and things like that. But in the real world, reality, how do you make that athlete experience uh, the right experience in real terms? Yeah, I think it happens quite a way prior to actually showing up on the doorstep of the villages. Um, uh, So we've got a series of athlete workshops uh, planned for early New Year. And and I guess it's at those times that we... You know, explain the you know the, the amazing you know team culture of Manaki to them and the values that you know the team you know have that you know support that team culture um, because you know you know respect integrity you know pride you know leadership excellence you know they are the five pillars of of what we stand for as a team and if we can help them engage with that um, that's I guess one one step um, you know clearly working with the you know the professionals at the NZOC who are you know, they're, they're working that kind of magic square trying to figure stuff out logistically, which is um, no small task uh, to make sure that the fundamentals are, are right because, you know, you, you can't you know, build something great without a strong foundation. So making sure that we've got enough beds and the right people in the right beds, um, that, that people's entries are uh, in on time, those sort of real, you know, hygiene factors. Uh, and then it's all the other things around there, what the, what the uniform feels like, you know, what does it look like, how, does, how do the athletes feel in that? Um, you know, the, the activations we have in the village with, you know, the posters and art and, and all those things. And so I guess it's a lots of little things that contribute to the overall experience. And uh, I guess as a, as a newbie, I'll be definitely relying heavily on the incumbent professionals to sort of help guide, you know, clearly what has worked pretty well up until now. It sounds like a tall order. Is there some nervousness, a little bit scary about what you're taking on, knowing what you've just described? I think I'd be lying if I said there wasn't. Um, you know, I've talked to a few people about, you know, I'm stepping out of a comfort zone, but that's part of growth as well, personally. I'm really looking forward to the challenge. But yeah, you're right. I mean, it's kind of one of those all care and, and no responsibility things where if things go well, you know, the athletes take all the glory as they should. If things don't go well, it's going to be on my shoulders, you know, as a spokesperson for the team. Um, and so I think that's where, you know, keep on going back to the, you know, the team at the NZOC, you know. You know, it isn't their first rodeo. They've done this many times before. It's a very compressed time period, but you know they've got all those how tos and, and wins um, dialed in. It's going to be quite a complex um, experience um, uh, to, to manage in Birmingham. There's multiple v- uh, village locations, uh, and so there's there's some elements of, of challenge around that. But I think at the end of the day, you know, if, if we can instill you know the, that the sense of, of you know, the culture of monarchy and, and the pillars of the values that go with it. You know, hopefully everybody behaves themselves. They perform really well with pride. Um, you know, they leave it all out there, do as absolutely much as they can. And then, you know, my job, I guess, becomes a lot easier. What sort of leader do you want to be? Because I don't look at this as management. I look at this as leadership and, and good organizations have great leaders and they've recognized that in you. So what style does Nigel Avery bring to the table? I think I'm quite collaborative. Um, you know, the, the combined decisions uh, create far, far better buy-in, I believe, versus you know, more dict- dictatorial. Uh, I think I'm a good listener and communicator and um, being able to listen. Um, we've got two ears and one mouth, so we probably should listen twice as much as we speak. Um, so Proverbs are Proverbs for a pretty good reason, right? So I plan on using a bit of, bit of those. But yeah, I think I, I get on well with most people. Um, uh, I'm pretty easy going, but at the same time, you know, if, if things um, aren't going the way we intended or what was expected, then, you know, I'm certainly prepared to um, have some, you know, reasonably hard discussions if, if that's required. But, yeah, certainly um, I see myself as being part of a team. Um, you know, clearly there's a leadership role there, but, um, you know, hopefully I can lead by example and, um, you know, the team members can 
you know, look up to me from, you know, perhaps what I've done in the past, but clearly, you know, I'll be judged um, on what happens in the next sort of 10 months or so, which, you know, it's exciting, but yeah, as you say, a little bit frightening too. Nigel, how will your experiences enable you to do your job properly? Yeah, I think I've had quite a, a varied experiences. Um, you know, I start off, you know, I trained as an accountant, um, so I understand numbers. Um, I worked as an accountant for a little bit, but then sort of moved into um, sort of business operational planning and management, um, some accounting as well, and then sales, new business development and, and key account management. So, um, you know, through that, that was through Asia and, and the US. So I'm used to speaking with um, people with, with different belief systems and, and cultures, definitely in, in the business sense and the life sense as well. So I think I can relate well to, you know, a, quite a variety of, of people. Um, but I, I think part of it is um, is preparation, um, you know, plan for the worst and hope for the best type of thing. Uh, I'm reasonably detailed and, and I think there's definitely elements of this. Um, and, you know, once again, go back to the NZOC guys, there'll be lots of checklists and double checks done to make sure we've done, you know, particularly the fundamentals really well. So I think a combination of all that um, plus the list definitely will um, you know, put me in good stead. You have an, an edge on other probably applicants that were because you've experienced the highs and the lows. There will be new athletes and there will be experienced athletes in this prospective 240 team around roundabout going to Birmingham. Yeah. How do you help someone that's new and going in fresh? And then how do you deal with someone that's maybe going in as a favorite and how do you cope with those pressures? Yeah, I guess everybody's um, unique and and some newcomers will just be like a water of a duck's back, you know, no problem at all. Others might be quite stressed and strained. And I guess it's about trying to identify that, you know, cut it off at the pass. And, you know, personally, I'd love to, you know, speak with as many people as I can, but the support team has got um, obviously some physicians and sports sites. So there's plenty of other people to speak with, including a bunch of other athletes in that support team group. So I think it's um, just making them, the newcomers realize that, yeah, this is a big environment. Um, you know, control as much as you can control, but just be aware that there's going to be some weird stuff that just pop up that you just won't expect and just acknowledge that, then park it and carry on with what you can control. So that would be my message to them. And I guess similarly for the, you know, the people who have, you know, I guess the weight of expectation, you know, going in as favorites or, you know, potential standing on the podium, all those things. And I guess the thing, the message is pretty similar. And say, look, you know, going in, everybody's at the same starting point. On paper, you might be up, up there on that um, potential podium, you know, position, but really it's got to be done on the day. So you just got to focus on your normal stuff and the result will, will come as a result of that. And, but, you know, clearly I'll be pretty keen to, to chat with those folks as well. But nine times out of 10, they've got plenty of experience and they're, they're pretty well dialed into where they need to be to perform well. Well, we had a perfect example, didn't we, at the Olympics with Laurel Hubbard, went in pretty much as a favourite in, in her division, absolutely tanked, tanked because, in, in her own words, it all got too much for her. Yeah, sorry, I'm just turning my phone off. I thought it was going to ring for a second. Um, yeah, well, that's right. And, and look, in life, there are, there are no, there's only two sure things, right? Death and taxes. There is no such thing as a sure thing. You know, I remember in, in Melbourne, um, one of the Nauru weightlifters was just, just an incredible favourite. And, um, you know, with sports betting over there, everybody's running around placing bets on him. Well, he cramped in both calves in his first snatch, no total. You know, so there's no such thing as a sure thing. And, and, uh, and that, yeah, unfortunately for, for Laurel, just there's obviously a lot going on, you know, with her leading up to that event. And, um, you know, clearly that would have had some effect on her, you know, mental ability on that day. So, yeah, personally, it'd be a shame for her to have to do that. But, hey, look, that's sport. You know, things happen. And, um, you know, it's just unfortunate she was on the, on the wrong side of that um, in Tokyo. You mentioned about being tripped up if you're a newbie. Was there an occasion you can remember that you got tripped up and went, oh, okay, that's what it's about? As in something unusual popped up? Yeah. Yeah, uh, the, the Sydney Olympics test event, we went on there and um, a guy with an enormous camera just shoved it right on my face <laughs> as I was about to go on the, on the stage. I was like, what is this? <laughs> It was, it was kind of weird, but that's why you have test events and, and that's why you go and do them to experience that and, and kind of get it out of the way. Well-being in your press release is, is, a, is a huge deal and it's such a big space in all sport and all in life, basically. And I, I wondered whether you made a point about well-being being a key on the back of the Olivia Podmore tragedy because 
that has brought well-being right to the forefront in athletics or in, in, in the games it's, environment? It, it certainly has. And, and um, you know, modern day athletes, I think, uh, have probably got a little bit more tougher than, than you know, my, my dinosaur myself, you know, 20 years ago, I, fin- I retired and there wasn't all that social media or that instant either gratification or vilification. And, and you know, the young athletes and, and our older ones now, that's what they've got to deal with. Um, so there's different layers of um, pressure on these people. And look, we rightly have to look at the well-being of, of, of our athletes and our support teams and, and everybody because, you know, not only they've got the, 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 the sport performance-based um, issues, it's also the other layer of, of what COVID brings to them and their families, you know, whether, you know, there's a... Uh, business at risk or they're in the tourism thing, all those things. So we, we kind of just don't know. So I'm sure sports are working on that. Um, but the way I look at it is that it's kind of like health and safety, you know, 10, 20 years ago, but you know, oh, whatever, you know, it's just a big pain in the bum, you know, health and safety. But at the end of the day, the health and safety of your employees and staff is of prime importance because without them, you can't operate. And, and ultimately, if you do the right things, you'll get actually really good productivity and in, 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 out of those um employees with the health and safety you know, protocols put in place. And I think it's the same in sport. You know, if you look after the health and well-being of, of our team members, they're going to go on feeling nurtured and welcomed and, and wanted. And I think ultimately that will help them perform better. How fine is the balance though between overstating well-being, but also being mindful that performance is why the individual is there? Well, that, that's a yeah, that's, that's a very good point. But I think the point I just made before is that if you've got everything, all those well-being things dialed in, it's going to enhance performance. It's not going to detract it. So I think it's just the, it's just the way that the athletes need to be encouraged, not that they don't need to be. Um, and, and I think you know, you know, mental strength is a is a is an amazing thing. We should be doing uh, as athletes mental strength training as much as we do physical strength training and flexibility and massage and rest. It should just be one of the things we do you know, to, to gain that resilience um, so that then that will enhance performance as well. Easy to talk about, but it's going to be a hard thing to manage, isn't it? It is. And, and you know, we're relying on sports who, you know, should know their athletes best. And, uh, you know, and, and once again, it's it's well prior to games that, you know, these things should be highlighted at sport level um, and programs and supports you know, put in place, you know, for these athletes who, you know, could be at risk or, you know, are susceptible to, you know, to, you know, so these sort of issues. So, at games time, you know, hopefully it becomes a, you know, a report by exception, red flag kind of deal where, you know, the, only a few things pop up that we're unaware of. But look, it, it's the same as an athlete. You know, my view is to try and control the controllables, um, but no, there's going to be unexpected things pop up. And we just got to have some plans to, to address those, you know, should they, should they arise. So one would suggest uh, that you will engage with all the sports about their well-being planned. Also, will you be taking a well-being individual to cover the bases? Uh, good question. I think the you know the athlete support um, uh, participants as, as part of the you know the, the, the wider support group um, they, they'll be part of that solution. But obviously, sports psych is another. Um, we, we can't obviously tell sport what to do. It's sport is in charge of their sport, um, but we certainly encourage them to be you know looking at that and, and and what have they got, what structure have they got in place to to manage that process for for well being in general. You talked about being a collaborative leader and inclusive leader. So does that mean you're a dad, a father, a, you know, a father, an uncle, a brother to the athletes? So where what where do you fit? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it depends on what the situation is. Um, yeah, uh, I haven't really thought about it in those terms. Um, look, I, I think it's you're probably you know, a member of the family. Uh, we're all whānau. Uh, we, we're definitely one team. Um, I, I don't believe in, in, in steep hierarchical you know, structures. Um, uh, we will get on and, and do things. Um, no sort of demarcation of responsibility. Well, there was demarcation of responsibilities, but we're not going to shy away from doing things that are needed to be done. So, yeah, I guess a combination of, of, of dad, friend, um, brother, sister, um, and maybe a policeman if, if hopefully it's not needed too much, but maybe just in case. Uh, are you a hugger? Oh, you know, if there's if, if uh, COVID restrictions allow, of course, and, and you know... Um, <laughs> 
Hey, uh, b before we move, just move on to the the future of the Commonwealth Games. Uh, I, I'm in, I'm intrigued to know um, mo moving forward. Uh, just what's important to you? What's the what's the what's the most important outcome for you for Birmingham 22? Oh, the most important outcome is, is to come home with 100 percent of the, the people we left the shore with who joined the group with um you know you know the safety health and well-being of the team is critically important um you know you know somebody said to me in one of the panel interviews you know, you know essentially i'm being entrusted with the safety of someone's son daughter brother um you know wife husband uh, and and that's uh that's a pretty big responsibility and so obviously we've got a security um uh, person's part of the, the you know part of the support team just to, to give us any clues on any crazy that might happen. And so that really is the prime goal. Uh, I think all around that though, clearly uh, as a nation, we want to see a, an amazing result from the team members. Uh, and we, we historically have done very well in the Commonwealth Games and, and um, you know, my goal and, and hope is that that carries on in Birmingham. The Commonwealth Games are trying to be more relevant. They want to change. So in the future, they are allowing host nations to well, basically pick their, I think, swimming athletics. They've got to stay, but everything else you can pick and choose. Are you in favour of that where maybe some nations could pick sports that they're strong in to uh, up their medal tally? What do you think about that concept? Yeah, um, I, I can see how you, people think that. And it's in reality, it probably would turn out to be the case. But I think fundamentally... The, the Commonwealth Games Federation has said, look, you know, things are getting kind of pricey, you know, and that's why we're, we're at Birmingham, not in South Africa at the moment, because the South African um, um, bid just couldn't get it over the line financially. So Birmingham, you know, fortunately and thankfully raised their hand and said, yes, we'll, we'll do it. Because we have the existing facilities, we don't have to build any more or too many. And I think it's the balance between, you know, what is the economic sort of cost to create this, you know, versus the economic return? And is that actually going to be real? Because as you probably know, some of these bid um, documents come out with some, you know, some pretty heroic um, you know, economic returns. Uh, and so I think it's, it's trying to get that balance of, you know, what can a, a country do within, within the realm of what they've got currently economically um, or in how much capital they have to invest and all those things. So I think it's, I think it's, a, it's, a, um, it's a really interesting um, uh, undertaking that, that they're, they're going down. And I think perhaps from we should support one final thought, Nigel, for any prospective games athlete that's listening and watching you right now, just tell them the feeling of putting the fern on for the first time. Yeah, it's, um, it's quite surreal. Uh, so, you know, going back to when I was nine years old, watching John Walker um, jumping up and down in front of the TV and going crazy with um, the family and watching that and then getting my team kit for Kuala Lumpur. And uh, it was like that. I just I said there. I just I just felt this fern on a black shirt. I can't remember what I was wearing. Uh, it might have been on my shorts actually. And it really was um, a pretty special emo emotional time. In fact, one of my um, teammates, James Swan, when he was competing, got emotional just on the platform. You know, because the build up is huge. You know, the the pathway to get to one of these pinnacle events is it's not an easy one, and it's generally not a short one. Uh, and so when people do finally get there, you know, just the enormity of the occasion, the relief, the pride, uh, it's pretty special. It's very special. And, and I think as a, as a member of the viewing public, every single person who wears that black fern, that uniform, is an amazing athlete, no matter what they do, in which sport, in which capacity, whether a reserve or, or, or an individual, to get there is an incredible feat. Uh, and so whether they... They win, lose, draw um, on the day. That by getting there is actually an amazing achievement. But our goal is to really step that up and get as many of them, you know, standing on those podiums as we possibly can. Because the Commonwealth Games, we've got a rich history in, and we do pretty well in it. It lifts pride. It's aspirational and inspirational, you know. And so we want as many young people just getting absorbed in it. Maybe they want to go and join a, a, a club or a sport or take up something new or. Or if they're in one to say, hey, I want to go there. I want to have that sort of John Worker moment like I did and, and be the next person on the podium in 10 years or is it 20, 20 years in my case. That's how long it took me. So it's a it's a really special event and um, I'm just absolutely thrilled to be part of it, to give back um, to 
you know, to young people uh, who, you know, like I was given to, you know, when I was slightly younger than I am now. Nigel, I think the Commonwealth Games team were in very good hands. Congratulations once again on being named Chef de Michon for 2022. And thanks for spending some time here on Playmakers. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it.